Thanks, Doug. Um, does everybody get a posty note? Yes. All right. And if you have something to write with, what I want you to do is this is called the life cycle, and I want you to just kind of write one of the words that you, this is your own personal opinion, and anonymous means don't put your name on it, you know. I know that's pretty obvious, but <laughs> don't put, that means don't put your name on the paper. Um, just write down one of these um, uh, descriptors. I'm not going to explain what they all mean. It's pretty obvious. Everything that's alive, every organization goes through a cycle. Um, so it's a normal thing. Um, like there is no church in Ephesus. We can't go visit it because it doesn't exist anymore. But it started other churches. That's why we're here. So, so I just want you to personally pick a, uh, a word that describes where you think this church is right now. And then I'm going to collect them. And at the end, if I don't forget, we're going to kind of group where they're at and stuff like that. It's just a snapshot kind of a thing. So... Again, just one of these words starting with purpose and ending on dropout. So if you could do that real quick and then just fold it up and I'll collect them. Um, and then we'll jump in and do our uh, pop quiz. So if you're ready, just hold it up and I'll get it. Okay, cool. Just whatever comes to mind. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Oh, no, no. I'll, I'll, I'll do it later. Well, life cycle is not an option. That's actually another test that we're working on. Oh, thanks. I'm just kidding. All right, thank you. Oh, got some more. Did I get everybody's? Okay, cool. All right, so did you have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah. All right. Well, I know it snowed in Urbandale and in Carroll, and then the guy I met with from the church in Alta, he said it, he got an inch and a half, so it's like winter's starting. I saw Doug wearing a coat. That's not a good sign. <laughs> so that means it's getting cold out. All right, without looking, I know you, we've had kind of a week off, but let's see if we can do our leadership levels um, quiz here so we can kind of commit this to memory, so to speak. Does anybody remember the first level? Good, position. What's the next one? Somebody else. Good. Somebody else. Good. And somebody else? Starts with a P. Anybody know what the top one is? Good. Personhood, good. Okay, anybody? Fair game on this one. What's this one? Yeah, that's the R. It's kind of tricky. It's two. People development. That's good. All right. People development. Um, okay, so what's the R word by position? What's, anybody remember? It's right. So this is the guy that has the nameplate and the desk, and that's it, right? He just has a title. And he's, it's about rights. You do it because I say, right? I'm the boss kind of thing. Good. Permission is what? Good. Relationships. Good. And negotiation happens at this level. 
before you can move to the next one. And the negotiation is, I'll follow you as long as what? Remember that? We might not say it out loud, but that's what's going around in our head, right? You know, you're old enough to be my grandson. Why would I follow you, right? All that stuff in your head, right? The last guy that wore those kinds of shoes, couldn't trust him. You know, all kinds of crazy stuff. It's, I'll follow you as long as you lead well, right? That's basically it. <clears throat> like, we'll give this a try, right? And I'll let you know if I don't think you're leading well, right? So that's, but that comes out of a relationship, right? <clears throat> Production's about what? Results. Good. Actually accomplishing something together. <clears throat> and I did the illustration about, um, you know, you can, you can announce from the music stand, the pulpit, whatever you got. Some pulpits you could float down the Mississippi River, they're that big. I mean, they're amazing. But anyway, another story for another day. Um, we need nursery workers, right? And you're sitting out on the pew saying, ew, babies, they smell bad, they're sticky, no way, don't do diapers. And, or you can build a relationship with the person, right? Hang out with them. If your thing's vitamin water, you drink vitamin water, Darjeeling tea, whatever, coffee, whatever your thing is, you hang out and do that. And you build a relationship. And then you say, oh, by the way, I volunteer at my church on Sundays, and I'm shorthanded. Could you help me out? It would mean a lot to me if you could ha come help me work in the nursery. And you're thinking to yourself, ew, babies. They smell bad. They're sticky. No way on diapers. That's what you're saying in your head. But then you go, but, okay, I'll come and help. Now, why did you do that? Well, because we're friends. I'll help. I'm doing it to help you out, right? And then you kind of find out that <clears throat> either babies aren't all that bad, and you really kind of like them. Or you find out, well, that's not really my thing, but there's some cool people here, and you get involved. So the idea here is that we're, we're doing something together, and that comes out of that relationship instead of just trying to uh, blast it out um, in mass, so to speak. People development's about what? I think you had that. Somebody? Yep. Good. Reproduction. So basically, at this level, taking the baby analogy, because baby's cute, right? Nobody, everybody likes babies. Um, you uh, have that person in the nursery now, and you say, hey, you know, when we hung out and drank Dar Darjeeling tea, I say that because I can't pronounce it, so it just makes it fun. I'm working on my speech. Darjeeling tea, whatever. We had vitamin water together. Yeah, well, find someone else to do that with. Build a relationship with them, and then invite them to. And so if I do that, then I have three people, and if I do that, then I have four people. So we're reproducing ourselves, right? Um, and that's the whole point, right? This is the Great Commission, right? You're, develop you're making more and better followers of Jesus, right? You're, we're loving one another, and our neighbor is ourself. We're serving, and we're um, reproducing ourselves. And, of course, the thing that I like to say is if everybody decided overnight no more babies in the world, what would happen? Yeah. There wouldn't be any more people on the earth, right? Now, um, same thing's true of any organization, right? If we don't reproduce ourselves, if we don't, God doesn't use us to find someone else like us or somewhere else in the church that, you know, will eventually won't be around. Um, and that's what ultimately happens when that life cycle in, when we're talking about the localized church, right? Now, the church universal is still around because people start new churches and, and things, you know, go. But eventually things stop reproducing um, in this life and then in local areas that they're not around anymore. Uh, personhood is about what? Yep. It's the song, right? And this is the, the idea of branding. People like what you do for the community. They like what you do for the organization. They might not want to be a part of it, but man, I'm really glad that Woodland Hills Church of Christ is there. And Man, it, our community is just so much better off with that. I like the people there. I like the pastor, whatever, right? Never go, because church isn't my thing, but those people are great. That's the idea here is this respect thing. The guy down here trying to do it right away, and it doesn't work that way. You have to go through the stages. So anyway, kind of hit that quick because this is a big chapter, the um, creating positive change. It's probably one of the most important ones, so we want to spend some time on it. Um, let's see. Did anybody have any questions about this chapter or anything we've talked about since that you want to bring up a little bit? Before I jump into this, okay. So, my aunt, uh, well, actually, it's my wife's aunt. I kind of adopt her. Aunt Judy, 
Now, you guys probably know her. She comes sometimes. But anyway, um, they live in Urbandale. And, of course, we lived in Chicago. We live in Cincinnati, Chicago, California. And whenever we would come and visit, Aunt and Judy's house was kind of like vacation house. And my wife kind of contributed to this. I'd walk in the door. I'd walk over to their recliner, their couch recliner thing. I'd just sit down, pop it open, and take a nap. It was just like, okay, vacation house. I still do that now when I go there. Even though I live in Urbandale, it's kind of like, okay, it's the vacation zone. You know, you just kind of relax. You chill out. I have a lot of fond memories of their house. Um, Our son, Kyler, we were going to school in Cincinnati. I was working on my master's, and my wife was finishing up her her, uh, uh, bachelor's degree. And we had our son. We called him a Cincinnati Red because he had red hair in Cincinnati. You know, if you're a sports fan, you can figure that out. I watched the Reds with my dad in the 70s, so it was kind of fun. But anyway, we're in this apartment, you know, by ourselves, just had this new baby, and we're like, why are we here? It's Thanksgiving. We're like, why don't we go and surprise everybody in Urbandale? They're all converging at Aunt Bud and Judy's house. So we just we didn't tell them we were coming. We just jumped in the car. We drove, got on, on 74 out of Cincinnati, drove all the way to 80 and came across. And uh, we had to nurse him. Well, I, we didn't have to, but you know what to, um, My wife did on the way because he was that little. I mean, he's a little guy, right? And it was cold, so we wrapped him up really well. I walk up to the front door, and I knock, right? And Judy answers the door, and I didn't say anything. I just hand her this, what, two-month-old baby? One month, yeah, it's even a better story than I remember. Just hand it to Aunt Judy, and she goes, oh, and giggles and grabs him and runs in, and it's just great. So I have memories like that that I just treasure. Now, um, Uncle Bud and Aunt Judy say, you know, we need to get a ranch-style house. They have a two-story house with their uh, washer and dryer in the basement, and they're like, you know, we're getting old. They're like, what, 70-ish, 70s? So, but when they say that, I don't like that, right? Why? Because they have these great memories of their house. It's my vacation house. I mean, if they move by some ranch it won't work my vacation mojo will be gone and you know what will happen to those memories that i have and this is something about change you know when we think about change we have these memories that are very specific to things that we see places like our church stuff like that so when anybody says anything about we need to change something it freaks us out and just like i don't want my, you know and bud and judy to, ch- to, ch- to move because i have those memories I, I have to realize that it's, that's really not the best thing for them kind of a thing. So just kind of a full disclosure there. Change isn't easy. And he says uh, right away, it's not easy to change leaders. In fact, I've discovered that leaders resist change as much as pe- followers do. The result, unchanged leaders equals unchanged organizations. People do what people see. Um, has anybody ever heard of a sigmoid curve? It's kind of a math. You, if you like to trade stocks or if you're a mathematical nerd, you might know what this is. But what it is, is it's just kind of a observation of how things work. So you start off here, and it's basically like a big S. And it goes up like this, and then it starts to go down. So basically, it's the, kind of the idea of an organization starts here. You kind of get thing, your footing, and then you ramp up, and you start growing and expanding and doing well. Then at some point, you start to level off. And so what tends to happen is, things will start to decline rapidly unless you start another S-curve, right? And you start ramping it back up. Typically, if you look at organizations, this is about a generation or 30 years or so in this time frame, sometimes more, sometimes less. But this kind of shows you why it's important to, to kind of recast your vision and your direction and start off kind of afresh because if you don't, what used to work will no longer work, and it'll actually start decelerating and going down like that. So that's, again, why change is so important uh, when we think of that. There's, um, I think it's Seth Godin is his name. He wrote a book called Purple uh, Cow. Has anyone ever read that book? He predicted kind of the, ch- the change of the mass marketing co- commercials and stuff. He predicted that things will be more advertised directly th- on the Internet through kind of watching what you search for and stuff like that. It's, be, it's more specific. And his basic theory was this. In an information age, after a while, your brain just shuts off. You just stop seeing things. And so he uses this illustration, and he, I guess he's a city guy because his kids never saw cows. So they're, going, they're in France in the countryside, and their kids are like, what are those things, right? And so he pulls the car over. The kids get out of the car, and they wave to the cows, and the cows come over, and they pet the cows. And I don't know you could pet cows, but I guess so. You know, they, they're, they're looking at these cows because they've never seen them. And so then after a while, they get in the car, and they drive. And after about a half an hour, the kids just don't see the cows anymore. They're, they know what a cow looks like. 
no big deal. And so he thought to himself, you know, if we saw a purple cow, then the kids would be, they would see it and they'd be interested in it. And this is true of our culture, our North American culture in our time period is we have so much information that people don't see things. You know, we can say, hey, we're this great church or we're this great organization or whatever. And people don't even hear what we're saying because you can get lost in the crowd. So he's, his book is mainly about businesses and how to get your name out and be different. But it's very true when we think about um, churches and organizations too. So something to think about. Um, some questions to, to consider. Why would someone come to our church? And so, for instance, um, a lot of the stuff that's out there, you know, like curriculum you can get and youth ministry stuff, is basically geared for reaching Christians, right? People that are already going to be in heaven, so to speak, already like church, like God and all that. So basically, it's like how to take uh, people from the Baptist church and bring it to your church or Lutherans or Methodists. And I don't, I'm not trying to be you know, mean about it, but a lot of it's already geared for that kind of a group, and because they know that the churches will buy that because that's the kind of people they want in their church, people that are already good, upstanding folks like that, but if we take what Jesus said seriously to go and make disciples, what he's saying is we need to find people that they don't go to church anywhere, right, so that totally changes how we go about this, so we need to ask why questions like, why would anyone who have already rejected all the churches in the area, why would they come here? And we need to start with that and, and try to figure out why would, what would attract them and make them interested in that as far as a place to think about uh, making changes. Um, page 51 in the Henry Ford, did anybody see that illustration with his Model T? What do you think of that? Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah, he wanted to keep the Model T black. He was so, I mean, I'd heard that a long time ago, but I didn't know he was so wrecking that car. And yeah. Yeah, he, yeah, he thought it'd be black. Yep, he started tearing stuff out of the car, throwing it around. Yeah, it's interesting. So he was very much attached to this the way it was, wasn't he? Now, without Henry Ford, we wouldn't have the automobile, but he didn't what? He didn't want to change it, right? For it worked, you know. But then, you know, he didn't want to change, and so things started going down, right? And that's why he, they had to make changes to it. But yeah, that's a really good illustration of that. Uh, the leader must be out in front to encourage change and grow and show the way to bring it about. Uh, he must first understand the two uh, re requisites, important requisites to bring about change, knowing the technical requirements and understanding the attitude and motivational demands about it. So a change can make sense logically, but still lead to anxiety or psychological dimension. Um, so he re recommends making a list of advantages and disadvantages that should show the result of the change. And then another list indicating the psychological impact. So you had the logical, then you have psychological, and it's kind of a good uh, exercise. What's interesting is a lot of times we think that, you know, because all the other churches are doing this, we should just automatically do it too. For instance, I don't know if you met John Seitz or not. He's one of my best friends. That just means I got all the dirt on him and he's got all the dirt on me, so we stay close so we don't rat each other out. But we got in trouble at Ozark a long time ago. So, But he's in Marion, which is outside of uh, Cedar Rapids. And he's, he, when he went there, the church was running 200 and now they're running 1,200. Now, how did he do it? Well, it's that book you got in your hand. He just, he lives this stuff out. He's a great leader. Um, anyway... They, uh, they had a typical scenario where they had a really old church building, right? And they needed to uh, sell it, get more land and all that. So they sold their old church building in the downtown area. I think they were renting a nursery with, you know, uh, where they have, you know, uh, child care, that kind of thing, for meeting on Sunday mornings while they had their, built their first building on their piece of property they had, or they have still. Um, and so they rented office space in downtown Marion. And if you were to go there, um, you never know it's a church. It's on a second story, and you have to go in and ring the, this buzzer, and you wouldn't, and you just got an, it's kind of an insider thing. It's kind of interesting. But anyway, um, they were all planning on putting, you know, the pastor and the youth minister and the children's minister and all that, you know, they were planning on building offices for them in the property. But one of the guys, and if you know Rockwell Collins, you know, they're a bunch of egg hedge engineers, right? So there's a guy uh, called Spreads Spreadsheet Sammy, which is a great name. In other words, nothing is real until you throw it into an Excel spreadsheet. Maybe you know some guys like that. So he throws everything in a spreadsheet, and he, ca and he analyzes it. <clears throat> well, he did that, you know, just to see, you know, what kind of their cost ratios were for this. And he realized that, you know, if we put our staff offices 
in our building, build, you know, use up our space for that, it'll take us 99 years to break even because they were getting such a good deal renting that suite downtown Marion. So guess what? They've been in three building projects now and they still have their offices downtown you know, Marion because they need all their space for the people they're bringing in. So that's a good example of it might make sense to follow the crowd, but if you really look at your situation and, and lay things out, sometimes the change makes more sense that way. Um, maybe you can help me with this page number. This is a really good one. I'd underline it or star it or put uh, circles around it, whatever. There's nothing more difficult to undertake, more perilous to conduct, or more certain, uncertain in its success than introducing change. What page is that on? 53. Page 53. See if you can find that. Why? The leader has for enemies all those who have done well under the old conditions and only lukewarm defenders and those who do well with the change. Um, so that is a huge thing when we think about changing things, right? It's a, it's a, it's a very perilous business. Um, when we, we were able to start a church in California and the church that was there closed, they uh, all resigned from leadership. They gave the, the, the title of the building, the property, they gave the whole campus to this church planning organization that hired my wife and I to go and start a church there. And so when we came in, you know, we were able to kind of come in and, and make the changes we needed to make and move things forward. And one of the older guys that was part of that group, his name is Bob, and he, Bob's one of my favorite friends. He, he did so many jumps in Vietnam. He's an airborne ranger, so he's a tough guy. And he owns a fence company, too. He'd always get up at 4.30 and make coffee at the church. You know, that's the first thing you need to do when you start a church is make coffee, and then everything works from there. But anyway, so he was always up at 4.30, which is pretty rare in California because everybody else got up at 9, 9.30. But anyway, tough guy, great guy, big heart. And... Um, Another church was thinking about doing the same thing. So I took Bob with me and said, hey, Bob, I need you to come with me and I need you to help me out. So we came to a group of people and we had this meeting at this old church building. And I said, before I say anything about you guys making a decision to close, kind of like we did, I want you to, I want you to uh, meet my friend Bob. So Bob got up and all Bob said was this. He said, you know, brothers and sisters, he said, you know, I did not want to close my church. He said, it was the hardest thing for me to do. He goes, I was so afraid that I was gonna lose all my friends. And then he got this big smile on his face and he goes, oh, but, he said, I have to tell you, he says, now, he goes, I have so many new friends, so many more new friends, you know, and it's kind of one of those things that you just want to cry, but you're a guy, so you stop yourself, but anyway, it was beautiful. I didn't have to say anything, right, because Bob knew what it was like to struggle with that change, but he understood why it was important to make those changes, so um, something to uh, consider when you're in a meeting, you can even use this at work. Go figure that. Um, when you're in a meeting and you get pushback, does anybody know what pushback is? We're not talking about the playground where you get pushed down in your water fountain. What was that? Yep, exactly, resistance. That's a more uh, sophisticated way to say it, that's good. Yes, resistance. Okay, let's do this. There you go. Let's see. Am I uncomfortable? So resistance or uh, pushback or is this wrong? So it's good to kind of just write this down. And so you're in this discussion, right? And things are getting heated. People don't, aren't interested in the change or whatever, or even talking about it. It's good to do this and say, okay, let's just back up a minute and ask these questions. Is this wrong, right? Especially in church, right? Um, if you're like me, these two things go like together like this, right? If something is, I, if I'm uncomfortable with it, it is wrong and <laughs> You believe me, brother, the Holy Spirit, Peter, James, Paul, all the apostles, even though I don't believe in apostles and saints, all the saints and apostles agree with me, right? And I'm right about this. You know, I got God on my side, right? Um, so it's good for someone to set me down and say, wait a second, Mike, is this wrong? Whatever we're thinking about changing or talking about changing, right? Because if it's wrong, well, of course we don't want to do it. If it's against the Bible, if it's against God, if it's against the church, right, of course we won't do it. So if it's wrong, then of course we won't do it. Or am I uncomfortable with it? And a lot of times it'll kind of make you go, okay, wait a minute. 
Well, it doesn't technically say anything in the Bible about, you know, I'm just uncomfortable with it. Okay, well then let's, let's talk about that, right? Doesn't mean you push people into things. But this is really good when we think about change to kind of separate these two things. Um, the scurvy illustration on page 54 and 55, did you guys tell me about that one? Yeah, he had a cure and no one would listen to him. What was the cure? Yeah. Citrus. Citrus. I think that's where they got the name Limeys, but I don't know. I'd have to do a historical search on that. But who knows? You know, the British sailors. Yeah, so they were dying of scurvy, and this guy figured out, just take some lemons on your voyage and eat the lemons, and you'll be fine. And did people adopt it right away and accept it? How long did it take? Forty years. Oh, my goodness. Isn't that crazy? (laughs) And notice this line, too. The needless loss of life simply because masses of people were resistant to change was more than unfortunate. It was outrageous. These are talking about people's lives. Don't let your attitude toward change or your own predisposition to avoid it create detrimental hindrances to your own personal success as a leader. That is a huge, huge thing. Something else to think about is uh, it's called speech codes. And this happens in all groups and all tribes and all, we might call that technical language in the business world, right? You know, if I'm a computer guy like GUI and all that, I know some of that stuff because I hung out with computer people in California, but um, it doesn't mean sticky things. But anyway, uh, but you know, when I say that, a few people know what I'm talking about and it's just, we're the only ones that get that. It's kind of like an inside joke thing. Uh, That if you study communications, this was a study that was done when uh, working class people in Chicago saved up a lot of money and they sent their kids to these Ivy League schools on the East Coast. And their kids would come back for break and their parents would look at them like, what's wrong with you? Because they're using all these big words now, right? And they're being sophisticated in their thought process. And they're kind of like, hey, college boy, take the trash out and you know, remember who's paying for your tuition, right? And so they realized, wait a second, you know? I, and they would snap back to their childhood language, and they could communicate with their mom and dad. And then when they went back to school, they flipped on the uh, Harvard, Yale, that kind of Princeton stuff, and were, was able to converse that way. So speech codes are things that we, a lot of times we're not aware of them, but we use them a lot. It's kind of like when the one fish said to the other fish, what's water, right? That's one of my favorite things about, you know, um, what's it called? It's called the curse of knowledge. So once you know something, it's impossible to, to go back to what it was like before you knew it. It's kind of the idea, right? So Christians have speech codes too. And uh, just to prove it to you, let's throw some up here. What are some things that Christians say that nobody would get if they didn't go to church or read the Bible or anything? Hallelujah, sister. Born again. That's right. Bless. Yes. What else? Sanctification. Are you saying you're better than me? Well, that's a different topic. We won't go there. Yes, resurrection. Resurrection. What's that? What's that? Sin. Saved. Yeah. Ooh, that sounds scary. Covered in the blood. Yeah, there was a guy at Cincinnati that wanted to talk about blood covenant with me all the time. And I'm like, dude, you're creeping me out. I'm a Christian. He'd come into my store and think because I worked there, he could witness to me. And I couldn't leave. And he was right. But I'm like, dude, you're creeping me out. And I'm a Christian. You know, cut that out. No, you got to talk about the blood. I'm like, well, that's not what it means. It means Jesus' death. Say it that way. That makes more sense. But nobody listens to me. Yeah, so these are speech codes, right? It doesn't mean these are bad words. You know, it's, it's better to know what bless means than to go rob a 7-Eleven or something, obviously. But if we use these words to people that God has called us to go and share the good news with, they're not going to get what we're saying. In fact, they're going to think what? If, if I'm around them, if they come to our service and we use these words, or we're hanging out as Christians and they're coming to the break room, they're going to think what? That we're better than them. Or I'm dumb. Yeah. You know, I'm just not smart enough to go to church. Or, and some, I don't know if you've ever had, you know, things happen in your life when one of your teachers pointed something out to you in school and made you feel bad. That stuff comes back to people. And they're like, oh, you know, and they feel ashamed and stuff. So we don't want to do that. So we just need to be aware of that. Um, all right. 
So I'm going to run through this people resist change thing. If you want to stop and talk about something, let me know, but I want to shoot through this so we can kind of get to some of the other stuff. People resist change when it is not self-initiated. Um, it's real important for people to uh, be a part of that process. People resist change because it disrupts routine. Habits are required reactions. Uh, we form habits and they form us. Change threatens our old habit patterns and forces us to think. Reevaluate and sometimes unlearn past behavior. Probably the best example of this is, I don't know if you ever read Jim Collins' book, Good to Great. It's, I, I think the guy is a Christian. I don't know, because the book is amazing. It's the idea of, he studied companies that were good companies, but just, they decided they wanted to be great companies. And he has this great analogy that works in all organizations, I would say including the church, which is simply this. Um, you need to get the right people on the bus, you need to get them in the right seats, and you need to get the wrong people off the bus. And that sounds unchristian, but, you know, Jesus says some stuff about, look, you want a divisive person once, and a second time, and it's like sayonara, right? You know, it's, you, you know, you, you've got one more warning. And if I warn you again, you need to find somewhere else to worship because you're dividing the body, that kind of stuff. So if, if someone's unhappy and doesn't like the direction the church is going, then why are we trying to keep them around when they're just going to make everyone unhappy, right? And we get off mission. So it's a great analogy. Get the right people on the bus. Get them in the right seats. You know, maybe you'd be better at changing diapers than greeting or whatever. Let's find the right place for you. And maybe you're just not happy. And okay, we'll help you find a church where you're happy kind of a thing. So it's a good thing. So what he says in his book too is routine is the enemy of the great. So if we're just constantly doing the same thing over and over again, we're not going to become great because we just kind of get stuck. Um, and I can attest to that in my own life and ministry. Uh, people resist change because it creates fear of the unknown. Um, people resist change when the change is unclear. When a decision has to be made, the longer it takes for people to hear it, this is huge. I'd underline this five times. The longer it takes for, he says employees, but you know, people, volunteers in our case, the longer it takes for them to hear and the further the desired changes from the decision maker, the more resistance that we'll receive. We do things really dumb, you know. We just kind of, I think, naturally just do that. Uh, my dad worked at Learjet, like, for 33 years or something like that. Crazy. And he would come home with these stories about how Learjet just didn't know what they were doing. And he would say that, you know, that place would be better off if it just ran itself. <laughs> now, that's quite, he could have written a book about how not to be a leader. Uh, my dad was in middle management because he, or no, he was in, he was a lead man. So he was at the top of the bottom rung because then they asked him to come up higher and he said no because he saw what happened if you were in middle management those were the guys they threw out right away right because you couldn't get rid of the people like my dad and the and the, he was an aircraft inspector so he had to inspect what the um the mechanics were doing couldn't get rid of the mechanics because you had to have someone fix the plane couldn't get rid of my dad he had to put his neck on the line and sign it right he's legally responsible the people in the middle you can get rid of them right but you're not going to get rid of yourself if you're at the top so he was like no i'm not going up there so he was a lead guy at the bottom rung he said they'd always bring a psychologist in, and he would preach at them and lecture them about how, and scold them about how they needed to work together, share ideas, be innovative. And my dad's like, they don't know what they're doing. He says, you think if they would just go and talk to the guy on the line that does it or work, fixes this part 40 plus hours a week and just ask him what he thought they could do. He said, it would be genius. We would get so much better work and we work together and we'd be all be happy. But no, they don't do that. The guys at the top would hire some guy, throw $100,000 at the guy, and he'd just come and bark at him and nothing changed, right? My dad was right about that. The worst thing to hear, whether you're in a church or at work, is for, there might be layoffs, right? You know, from corporate. You invest the work, that's gonna just, you're not gonna get anything done. You're gonna be worried about your job. Same thing in a volunteer organization, right? Oh, we're not going to have that thing that we do every year for 50 years? Well, who said that? Why do they, you know, that's the worst way to make changes happen, but yet that's how it usually ends up happening. You want to start where people are at and, and talk to them about making changes. How can, we, how can we help you out? Do you need anything? What seems to be working for you? What seems to not be working for you? Is there anything we need to do different? They will have ideas about that. So it's always good to start where people are at. Um, Okay. Proves just change because it creates fear of failure. Proves just change when the rewards don't match up with the effort change requires. People will not change until they perceive the advantages or change outweighs the disadvantages of continuing the way things are. Leaders sometimes fail to recognize 
is that the followers will always weigh the advantages, disadvantages issue in light of personal gain loss, not organizational gain loss. Something I wish I'd have known 30 year, years ago when I started this is I always saw it from the organization's perspective because that's kind of the role God put me in. Not everybody sees it that way. That was total uh, revelation to me. You know, they need to see it from their family's perspective. Their God's, God set them up as responsible for their wife and their kids, and they have a perspective too. And I, I would not see it. I didn't see it that way, and, it, and that really cost me. So it's important to see where people are at and be able to talk about change in a way that would, be, would benefit them too. People just change when they are too satisfied with the way things are. Many organizations and people will choose to die before they choose to change. Um, the Swiss watchmakers, what page is that on? Page 59, Swiss watchmakers. So in 1940, 80% of the watches were all made, right? And somebody had an idea. What was the idea, remember? The digital, the digital yeah. That was a bad idea. I've never seen a digital watch since. No, I'm just kidding. There's one right back there, right? Yeah, and what did they say to them? No, get out of here. We, no, we don't, we don't need a digital watch, right? We make the best watches in the world. Well, guess what? Now it's like what? Yeah, isn't that funny? It flipped. So were they dead wrong about that, right? To use a modern illustration, um, you, and here's our GUI, right? GUI means what? Yeah, see, he passed the test. I knew what it was, trust me. Anyway, so the GUI is basically you can see on the screen instead of having to be a nerd, no offense, having to be a nerd and write all the code in, right, all the time if you wanted it to do whatever. I remember in high school, we had, we t had to type in like two pages of something for the thing to just to do something crazy on the screen. It was boring, but anyway. It was pretty cool. Now you can actually see what's going on. You can move this little mouse around, this cursor around, and click things. And the, it's, it's, what's the word? It's uh, user-friendly, right? So anybody can use a, a computer now. The guys that invented that were worked for Xerox at the time. And they came to the Xerox execs and, say, and said, hey, look what we've invented. And they go, we make copiers. Get out of here, right? I mean, so the Apple guys, either I think they either found them or stole it from them. I don't remember what, but... You know, the Apple capitalized on that, that uh, mouse kind of a thing. So it's, it's, well, it's, good why, it's good to think about why change is important. So as far as CEM goes, the last, last year we lost three churches. Sometimes that happens because people move out of the country and they follow the jobs. But a lot of times it's just that churches refuse to change. And eventually, you know, they, they decline. Uh, we lost the church in Storm Lake, the church in Sioux City, Morningside, and the church in Akron. So last year. So, so, f or does that, yeah. Uh, people resist change when engaged in negative thinking. People resist change when the followers lack respect for the leader. Kind of like the five uh, levels of leadership. That's why that's important to keep growing that. Uh, people resist change when the leader is susceptible to feelings of personal criticism. This is not easy for any of us when we get feedback. In fact, there's a book that my wife pointed out to me that's really helped me a lot called Thanks for the Feedback. It's really good. Um, I'd highly recommend it. Um, it's helped me a lot on this ability to handle criticism well. Uh, people resist change when, they, when change may mean personal loss. This is a good thing, too, I'd underline this. So whenever you make a change, there's three groups of people, right? The first one is those who will lose. The second one is those who are neutral. And the third is those uh, who will benefit. Each group is different and must be handled with sensitivity, but also with straightforwardness. So we might think, well, of course, right? But you need to think strategically before you make changes, know who those groups are, and then address it before, you know, you open up a big can of you know what. Yep. So sometimes those groups overlap. Yep. Even yep. Know. Right. Yep. And sometimes those groups overlap. I heard, I'm doing this for the tape, so Dewey will <laughs> still like me and talk to me. Just kidding. Uh, yeah, there he is. Oh, he likes this. Okay, I'm doing better. I can be taught. Uh, let's see. So sometimes those groups overlap, and sometimes people win and lose because of different things. Is that right? Okay, good. That's a very good point. Yeah, it's not all cut and dried like we like to, to think about it, but it's good to try to think through some of that and, and head that off at the pass, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about on how to make those changes in a little bit. But it's just the biblical idea of, of uh, you know, weep with those who weep and mourn with those who mourn kind of a thing, or maybe it's the other way around. But uh, you don't want to weep with those who are rejoicing and mourn with those who are weeping. It doesn't work. I've tried it. Not good. Uh, people just change because it requires additional commitment. Half of knowing what you want is knowing what you must give up before you get it. Um, so how this works is a lot of times in church, you know, I'll be juggling five things, right? 
And Doug comes up to me and says, hey, Mike, i got this great ministry idea for you. Now, what am I going to say? Yeah, are you out of your mind? Can't you see? I'm, you know, I know you're a preacher and you're supposed to make me feel guilty for whatever. But come on, Doug. You know, I'm juggling five things here, right? But if Doug came up to me, and he would do this because he's a smart guy, right? Hey, Mike, how would you like to have to only juggle three of those things instead of five? Think up my uh, attitude would be different about that. I'd be like, hey, you're my best friend. Let's talk, right? That is, you know, that's a big thing. So we're not asking people to do more in our church. We're asking them to, to, to get the most out of the time they have and, and actually pare down maybe what they're doing so that they can, do, they can enjoy what they're doing and, and maybe even do it better. So that's kind of the idea is not just asking people for additional commitment, but also helping them reprioritize things. Um, yep. Yep, and a lot of times, you know, we mean well, but, but what ends up happening is we end up doing more and more things, and then people go, well, they've got it handled. They've got it handled. But when really we don't, we're getting worn out. When really it opens up places for people to serve, and we can, we can bring them alongside of them and train them. Um, turn to page 62 and 63, that checklist for change. This is awesome. This is worth the whole, uh, what, $13 you paid for the book or whatever it was, 14 uh, I'll, I won't, no comment, no comment, all right, so that checklist for change is, is just fantastico, okay, this is my, I need to get this copyrighted, because it's so cool, yeah, you get me, don't you, okay, this is kind of like a, what do they call a microscope, amoebas, or whatever, it's kind of neat, So, this big circle represents the organization, like in our case, the church, right? Uh, the, the bigger red circles represent uh, influencers. Remember how we talked about that earlier? Influencers, know who the influencers are, that kind of thing. And then the dots represent the people that follow their particular influencer. Um, for instance, I was talking with, when was that? A guy yesterday about this. And he was talking about how he kept seeing it as, well, we used to have all these circles. We had like a, a music team. A, you know, we had like a prayer team. I go, no, 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 that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about influencers. I said, do you have like a, you have people that just, when they say things, people gather around them. He goes, yeah, we got a guy that he likes to talk hunting and guys follow him around the church. I'm like, there you go. He's a leader. And he has influence with those guys that follow him around, listen to his hunting stories, right? That's, that's all I'm talking about. I'm not talking about formal stuff, right? So how this works is you have, influencers that influence individuals and then these influencers affect the whole group so for instance um let's say doug you know i, I like doug we get along and just you know i need an example so let's say doug comes up and preaches on sunday and he's planning on preaching on sunday but on saturday night he has some bad sushi or a bad burrito or something he gets this wild dream and he sees this nine foot jesus that says doug i command you to sell the building you know uh, 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 st uh, go and move to um, uh, see Dexter yeah go move to Dexter start a day spa for me so Doug gets up because he's a faithful he does what Jesus tells him he's a humble servant he says God sent Jesus and he told me this and we're going to do this now what would happen well I guarantee you this is either going to happen in the building or on the way home people are going to start lighting up the cell phones and go <laughs> you know I'm going to be calling my influencer going what is Doug talking about? Has he lost his mind? And, and what is the influencer going to say? I have no idea. Did you know? No, I had no idea what you're, you know what I'm saying? But this happens, doesn't it? We do, we do crazy things like that as leaders. We say, so let it be written, so let it be done, like Moses, right? That's the way it is. And nobody knows what's going on. And then we have this big hullabaloo, right? That's the biblical word, right? Uh, everybody's worked up and not happy. Uh, the better way to do it is to, to have a good relationship with all the influencers. So if I'm leading this, or Doug's leading this, or whoever's leading this, or if you're leading your team, nursery team or whatever, I have influencers on my team, right? You can do this at work too. Um, if I meet with them for vitamin water, Darjeeling tea, double espresso, what else can you drink? Water, diet water, soda, whatever. We hang out, we do our thing, right? I'm running out of stuff, lemonade. Um, 
We hang out. We have a good relationship. We meet once a week. We meet twice a week. We meet twice a month. Whatever I can do that doesn't seem weird but normal. I have a good relationship with these folks. Why? Because I want, to, I want my influence to grow. Why? If I don't have influence, can I do what Jesus called me to do? Can I bring anybody to Christ if I have no influence? Can I grow people in Christ if I have no influence? So it's not like I'm trying to be a billionaire and, and use people. for This is not an evil plan, right? Although when you say evil plan, people pay more attention. So I do that sometimes. But it's a good plan, not an evil plan, right? So if, if I'm hanging out with the influencers, right, and we're doing our uh, vitamin water thing or whatever, and then I say, hey, you know, by the way, I'm thinking about this. Would you think and pray about that? And then we get back and have vitamin water again next week or whatever it is we like doing, tea and crumpets. Tell me what you think. None of this, we're going to do it this way, right? So let it be written, so let it be done stuff. I'm an elder, so I'm a deacon, so I'm the pastor, so we're going to do it. None of that None of that stuff. We knock that stuff out. You just, in your conversation, say, I've been thinking, praying about that. Let me know what you think. You get, you get back with them, and they say, well, you know what? Um, I don't like it. Okay, well, what do you not like about it? I don't like this. I don't like that. I don't like this other thing. Okay, well, have you thought about this, that, and the other thing? Not really. Okay, well, think and pray about that, and let's get, see what I'm saying? You want people to process, you want the influencer and you to process things individually and get on the same page with it. And then when you get your influencers on the same page with it, then you stand up and you make it official. And by that time, the word has got out. Hey, you hear what they're thinking about doing? Yeah, man, that'd be great. I think it's really cool. You let the leak get out in a good way and you have momentum behind it. Yep. Oh, good. Good. So you're saying it was an informal thing that happened around the kitchen, started talking about it. Right. 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 So you had influencers that got behind it and it made it happen. Yeah. On purpose? I mean, yeah, on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's oh, interesting. Oh, it's real so it only lasts for two weeks, so he's still feeling the wrong one. <laughs> that's a good example. He had decided. So he was the opposite. And he told nobody. Right. He just yeah, that's the fast way to fail. Don't tell anybody. Yeah. Don't get anybody on the, your side and then just push it down people's throats and they will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. And unfortunately, you know, people like Doug and I w- that are, have formal Bible school training, you know, whatever. And, w- you know, we both went to good schools. You know, I like the schools we both went to. Uh, but we were trained that if you pray, you read the Bible correctly, and you, you preach, the Holy Spirit does all this stuff automatically. Well, no. It's called biblical wisdom and stuff like this, right, that, you know, I had to learn the hard way. So um, there's a good way to do this. And so page... Um, 62 and 63, that checklist for change is just brilliant, right? If you like English words, or it's smashing, right? Smashingly good. Um, So you see the list there? So basically what it's saying is, if you follow that list and you get more yeses than no's, the more yeses you get, the better it'll go through, right? The more no's you get, the more resistance you'll have with it. So that is really, really good. I know a guy started a church, he's he's doing really great. Every time they need to make a change, even though he's the biggest influencer in the church, even though he started the church, he and his family, he does this. They'll get this sheet out, and he'll meet with his leaders, and he actually, and what's really wild is they, they've never met. They've been, in, you know, this is the funniest thing. They've never actually had a meeting. They do it through email and stuff. It's crazy. Um, a church that never, doesn't have uh, leadership meetings, but he does it. Anyway, they, they do this, right? And they say, okay. Who's on board with this change? Who is not on board with it? Okay, I'll go talk to them and kind of help them process it. We'll we'll, we'll see where they're at. And they wait until they get enough people on board with it, right, where the influencers are. 
and then the thing goes through, and then they shred all the evidence of, you know, them talking about people. Not because they were gossiping, just, that, you know, they want someone to look at that going, hey, what are you guys doing, right? But they were smart about how they, um, they did that. So that is a great, you want to use that every time you need to make any kind of a change, whether you're a brand new church or whether you've been around a long, long time. Page 64 is a really cool graph. I have a nerdy friend, uh, not Jason, although he is a friend, and I won't say anything else about that. But anyway, um, I have a nerdy friend. He's actually a pastor nerd, which is kind of weird, but anyway, they do exist. He, ha- he calls it something about the dis- dissemination of something, but it's, I like to call it a worm graph because I'm sophisticated. So anyway, page... 64. So we've got um, innovators, right? 2% milk. Yep. Then we have early adopters, right? What's that? 10%. And then we have adopters, right? Oh, middle adopters. Is that 60? I knew I knew one of them. So that's it. And then we have uh, late adopters, right? What's that? 20? 20%? And then we have laggards, like sluggards. What's that? 8%. Okay, any math whizzes? Did we do it right? 100%. All right, cool. So, anybody know what a TiVo is? What's a TiVo? Right, it's a newfangled VCR, right? Yep, you can record your television digitally. It's like a digital video recording, I guess is the technical word. But So TiVo, it's actually in the English dictionary. So the people that um, started this TiVo, they got um, Joe Montani that, that just by happenstance is the greatest quarterback that ever lived, and we can debate that later, but um, unbelievable quarterback. And Jerry Rice, which is probably one of the best receivers, right, for the Niners, they both uh, bought a lot of this company, were sold on it, and so they made these crazy commercials where they rubbed this crazy jelly on their tummy on the golf course. They were really weird commercials. But they succeeded in getting this term TiVo out. It's actually in the dictionary. You can, I think it's, it's either an urban dictionary or a legit dictionary. I don't know. But most people know what a TiVo is. But, and what they did is they hit this big group right here, this middle adopters, with mass media advertising, like on television stuff. Now, everybody knows if you don't get this group, nothing will change. You got to get that big group in the middle to, to move the change along or nothing will change. doesn't matter if, if I want you to change your habits and say, I can't live without a TiVo. I got to buy one. That's, you know, that's a change, right? So, and that's how people use marketing. What they failed to recognize or, or do was they thought if they could just hit this group directly, they wouldn't have to go the old fashioned way, which is this way. This is the only way things work. Now, guess what happened? They didn't sell very many TiVos, and they had to sell the company to someone else, and that changed it all together. So the reason was they didn't start with the innovators. Innovators are people like my mom. My mom has to have the latest and greatest of everything, right? So my mom, right now, um, I could call her and ask her what the new phone she's waiting for. She's got a brand new cell phone at the cell phone store on hold, and all she's waiting for is my dad to tell her, it's okay, seller, you can buy a new cell phone. The second he says, go ahead and buy, she's got, she's driving and calling the guy, oh, get it ready, charge up the battery, I'm coming, right? And there are people like that that we know. My mom's got to have the latest and greatest of everything, right? Now, most people think my mom's a nut, right? You're wasting your money. What's wrong with you, right? But there are these early adopters that kind of watch people like my mom, right? Every now and then, my mom will bump into something that's actually pretty cool. And they'll go, huh, how does that work? Oh, like this, you know. Oh, you know, I might be able to use one of those. And guess what they do? They buy one. Now, the people in the middle, well, I didn't do that right, did I? There we go. People in the middle actually respect these people, right? These people are nuts. But they look at these people and say, you know, these people are good with their money. They just don't buy everything that comes out. They call that the bleeding edge of technology, right? You don't want to be on the bleeding edge. Cutting edge, okay, not bleeding edge. You know, show me how that works. Okay, yeah, I could use one of those. And then they start buying it, right? And then you have people over here that they just are slow to change. Well, I don't know, right? And they kind of get dragged into this, right? You know, like when they they had that big thing where they shot off all the, what, analog uh, 
antennas, did they do that here? It was all going to be digital. See, they were drug into the new you know, millennial by their analog uh, rabbit ears weren't going to work anymore. They had to have a digital antenna, that kind of stuff. I got a friend who works for Seagate. He's a, he's a high up uh, vice president. He got so high up in the company that they forced him to, to use a cell phone. And I mean, part of what the Seagate does is they, they make parts for cell phones. And he, didn't, he never owned a cell phone. I mean, this is an old school guy. He worked hard at work and didn't want anybody bothering him at home or calling him on the road. But they gave him a cell phone and said, you will use it. So they, they drug him into that, right? So this is how things change. Uh, what happens with this is most of our decision-making boards, and we've talked about this, are made up of this, these groups of people. Yeah, every time I do that, I get, see, Doug's been around the block a few times. You hit your head against these folks, haven't you? I did this, the one guy goes, oh, man, he goes, that explains so much, right? <laughs> it does. I've been there too, right? We try to get these people to change. Come on, come on, come on. They ain't going to change anything. That's just who they are. You know, they're the anchor. of. They're, and so you, you can't have these people on your decision-making board. You just can't. Or you won't change anything. I mean, they're good people, but don't put them on your decision-making board. When you need to move forward and be ahead of things and, and, and be where God is at, reaching people who don't know anything about him, you need these people on your board. So this explains a lot as far as how, how change is processed and why you need this group uh, in that, uh, that mix. Let's see, we're up till eight, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep, it's a good example. Yes, that's a good point. And what Jason is saying is sometimes the people that are the innovators become the, the late adopters and laggers because they don't want to change, kind of like what Henry Ford. He was so intricate to that. Right, exactly, right. Yeah, and with technology, especially in the Bay Area, we used to let it move so fast. I mean, you just, about the time you had the thing paid off, it, it didn't work anymore. You know, it was kind of crazy. I mean, it really was. A good example is, you know, you can be so close to the innovation part of it that you miss kind of the application part. So, for instance, we call cell phones cell phones. That sounds kind of funny, right? But everywhere else in the world, they call them what? Mobiles, see? Why would you call it a cell phone unless you are part of, you know, well, it's the cell tower that you got to have or your phone won't work, right? So we get that as Americans because we invented it. But in England, it's um, my mobile or whatever, right? And they say it cooler than I do because they have a cool one. But yeah, exactly. Good point. So it seems that the change happens very fast now. Yes. Yes. And um, as far as technology goes and everything, and, and we'll talk about, like, how to bring the change about, which is important, but... Um, but yeah, you have to be, because people are processing things differently than, than they used to. Like for instance, one of the things I noticed about this job is I've been able to get out of the local church scene and actually kind of see it kind of as an observer. One of the few places in any time in life that I'm not looking at this thing, right, with the screen on it, you know, I'm not like, you know, is at church, right? I put this thing away and I listen to some guy talk, you know. Most people don't do that. Most people, if it's not on here, it's not real, right? I'm not saying that we stick this up here and that's the new pastor or anything, but we have to think about how people process things, right? If you can get your TV show on demand when you want to watch it, that changes your whole perspective on before you used to watch the news and Johnny Carson and go to bed, right? Everybody did that. Nobody does that now, right? And if you don't know who Johnny Carson is, no, you guys do. Um, good. And maybe the, answer, maybe the answer to that, I think, is kind of just the perspective of what kind of business are we in, right? It's that old thing. If I'm in the railroad business, uh, over time, you know, my, uh, or the horse and buggy business would be better, right? Because I'm not going to sell a lot of those. I might still sell railroad parts. But if I'm in the transportation business, then I change. What, 
What's going to get people from point A to B? I don't care if it's a buggy, if it's a train, if it's a flying saucer, right? What's, you know, that kind of a thing. That just kind of changes your mentality. Um, we can get real close to how we accomplish something instead of what, what God's called us to accomplish. I'm going to skip a little bit here. Uh, over to creating a climate for change happens when, so let's do those. And I, did I talk to you about the jet ski and the aircraft carrier last time? Okay, so I won't bore you with that. But the idea of kind of how change, oh, and he does say this is important too. The longer an organization has gone without change, the more effort introducing it will require. So that's a good factor. Also, when change is implemented and the result is negative, people within the organization will be leery of embracing future changes. So we need to be aware of that. We need to know our own context. The opposite is true. Successful changes in the past prepare people to readily accept more changes. Look for wins to celebrate. One of the important things to do is to celebrate things. Like I'd say the prayer room was a, was a good success, right? Let's celebrate that. That was a good thing, right? Um, things like that. So creating a climate for change happens when influencers are placed in leadership positions. Uh, they're going somewhere, and they're able to persuade others to follow them. Creating a climate for change happens when the leader checks the change in his pocket. You've probably heard that illustration. When you have to be overdrawn, um, you know, for it, lack of a for real quickly, um, working with Mario when I came in five years ago, Mario had already been on the ground for five years, and how we were doing that with the, his uh, Hispanic church plant totally needed to change around. So I spent literally every change I had, every nickel and dime in my pocket, I had relationally with Mario. And, you know, we were uh, 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 no amigos for a while, if you know what I'm saying. He wasn't his wife. He wanted to kill me, right? And I love, I love Mar Maria. She's great. But, you know, she's like, what are you doing to us, right? I'm like, we need to flip this around. So I had to spend a lot of change, and it wasn't very happy. Now we're, now we're amigos again. We're, we're great. Things are working out. But sometimes, you know, that change in your pocket will, and I probably could have done a better job of getting more change first. But anyway, you learn, hopefully. Uh, creating climate for change happens when the leader solicits support of the influencer before the change is made public. Turn to page 69, 10-item checklist. Credit climate for change happens when the leader develops a meeting agenda that will assist change. Every new idea goes through three phases. I love it. It will not work. It will cost too much. And though it was a good idea, oh, I thought it was a good idea all along. So this is between us and the tape, right? I shared some things with Mario, and he didn't like my ideas. So we backed off his support $100 a month for three and a half years. That's pretty gracious, too. It was real slow. But he got real smart real fast. And uh, he went down to Mexico, talked to a guy, and the guy told him pretty much what I said. But it was like the greatest thing he'd ever heard. He comes and tells me them, and I'm like, that's great, Mario. I think you should do it. I think that's great. You know, I'm not like, well, those are my ideas. Who cares, right? He got it. Um, so it's important that we let people go through that phrase, those phases. And even if there were our ideas, who cares, right, as long as they get it. Uh, underline this. Again, don't tell Mario I said that. A wise leader... Understanding that people change through a process will develop a meeting agenda to enhance this process. Again, a wise leader understanding that people change through a process will develop a meeting agenda to enhance this process. This is huge. So page 70 has those meeting agenda items. Study items or information items, study items, and action items. This is, I wish I'd have known this a long time ago. So you keep things in the information uh, stage until people, you know, are ready to act on it. And if people aren't ready to act on it yet, you keep it in the information stage and, until you, you move it down. And you, you work that amoeba thing that I had. You work the influencers one-on-one um, -on -one, uh, and it's real important that you do that. Okay. So, let's see if I can get this right. I'm going to write some words up here. You tell me if you know what I'm talking about. Probably didn't spell that right. Anybody know what that is? Yes. When we talk about change, I'm convinced, the more I do this, 
that we're talking about grief. And I'm going to hand these out to you um, just to kind of stick this in your book and your notes. So it's important that when we're asking anybody to change, we need to, we need to be like Doug. Doug does this at work, don't you, Doug? Pastoring people in the hospital and stuff, right? And you could probably identify where someone's at right away. You're probably trained to do that, right? So whenever we're asking people to change anything in their church, we need to treat it like this because it will explain a lot of where people are at. Um, instead of just trying to shove things through to people and say, it's, this is why we need to do this, um, it, it will help us understand where people are at. And so the sheet I passed out says denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance, the five stages of grief. And one of the things I wish I'd have known too was if in that information items, discussion items, action items, yeah, that's the three. If, we're, if, I'm, if I have a group of people on my team, whatever the team is, whether that the team is the whole church, whether the team is my you know, ministry that I'm a team leader of, or it's a nursery team or whatever, if my influencers are on there and I'm, we're all talking in a group and I'm getting pushed back, they don't want to make, they don't want to even talk about this change. I need to back up and I need to take those, in, I need to talk to them one-on-one -on -one with the Darjeeling tea or whatever until I can get them on, I can get them through those five stages of grief. I can get them through that, then they'll accept it. That, see that last part on there? And that list says, acceptance, stop struggling to resist emotional detachment. If I can emotionally detach myself from it because I've grieved it, then I'm ready to accept the new thing. But I gotta wait till someone is there. Because if I don't wait, it's gonna be bad. It's gonna be a fight. People are gonna get hurt, the collateral damage stuff. So I need to help them get through that, convince them one-on-one, -on -one, because they can tell me they don't like me, they can tell me that, that, that they think I'm destroying the church, they can tell me whatever they want to one-on-one -on -one with me, and get that stuff out, let's talk through it. Then, they're like, you know, I shouldn't have said that stuff to you, and you say, hey, that's okay, I understand that, you're, that you have good memories here, or that you got hurt by the last guy that tried to make a change, and it, and it destroyed your church back in wherever you, you know what I mean? You have to let people talk about those things and get that stuff out, and get past it, so that then they can say, because most of us want the same thing. We want people to come to know Jesus and follow him. It's just that there's a lot of stuff that gets in the way as to how do we do that together that's, that's effective. So we need to be able to help people navigate through this so that they can go, oh, okay, I see that now. Okay, I get it. I see that, you know, not necessarily what I would like to do, but my kids and my grandkids would love this, and we, we want something to be here you know, after the time the Lord's called me home, that kind of a thing. So uh, there's a, I forgot what page it's on. It's uh, the two buckets, one with water and one with gasoline. You know where I'm talking about? I should write the page numbers down here. What was that? Page 70. Page 70. So underline that, star it, do crazy stuff with it. Uh, so you have two buckets of water, right? So kind of like with those influencers, right? When I was talking about the big circle here. So what happens is your influencer or somebody... That, has, that, has, that somebody else has influence over will be doing something or doing something with the church, with people, and something will happen. Some bone of contention will happen, right? A little fire of contention. Now, the influencer has, a, has an option. They can either throw gasoline on and go, oh my goodness, you're right. That is terrible. Oops, sorry. I can't believe it. Right, can't believe that guy's so loud. You know, and you throw gas on it and you burn your church down. Now, you've probably been hurt by people before. I have. Don't do that. Don't burn your church down. I mean, Jesus died for these people. Don't go nuts and crazy and burn your church down. Throw the bucket of water on it and say, hey, you know what? We know what's going on. We're working on it. We're on top of it, right? We're, we're you know, it's going to be okay. You, you help calm people down. And this, this is what influencers do. This is what leaders do. We need to train people. That's why it's important that we have a culture of leadership where we, we grow and we mature so that when people, we're tempted or people are tempted to freak out and throw gas on something that really doesn't matter in, in the eternity of things. You know, I mean, if, if, if God is bringing people to Christ and they're growing in Christ and there's something I don't like going on and I make a big deal out of it and I burn the place down, all that stuff has been lost or the, the capacity for that to continue has been lost. So we don't want to do that. We want to be able to throw the water on it and to be able to communicate uh, in that way. Creating uh, change, for the change happens when the leader shows the people how the change will benefit them. That's real important. 
Climate, creating climate for change happens when the leader gives the people ownership of the change. Changing people's habits and ways of thinking is like writing instructions in the snow during a snowstorm. That's good. Do you see that? What page is that? 70 probably. Every 20 minutes, the instruction must be rewritten unless ownership is given along with instruction. The best way to give people ownership of something or let them have ownership is if you, have, if you let them lead something and they make a mistake, instead of spanking them in public and making an example out of them, you thank them. You say, wow, I'm so glad you've been doing this ministry. You're trying something new. You're trying to bring people to Christ. You're trying to grow them from Christ. We're so glad you're here. Thank you for trying. That blows people away. Because either we spank them or we take the ministry away from them. Say, well, you're not ready for this. I'll do it. I'll just do it myself because I can do it better. And they'll go, well, I guess it wasn't mine anyway to start with. But if we let them make mistakes and we thank them for making mistakes, and we, you know, they'll be blown away. They'll go, well, this really is my ministry. Well, of course it is. God's called you to do that, not me. I'm not going to take that from you, right? And then in that context, they'll be more open to feedback and say, well, you know, what can we learn from this? How can we, you know, move forward on this? I think sometimes we get so wound up about not making any mistakes, we don't change anything. And if we don't change anything, we don't find ways to, to, to meet people where they're at and help them come to Christ. Good. Freedom to fail, yep. That's right. You won't. Yeah, if you just have to succeed... Or if you just have to exist, yeah, you're not, you're going to, exactly, you've already failed in a lot of ways. That's good. Yep. Um, I like my friend, he calls them mistakes or us. I don't know if I've shared that with you yet. So his target is young uh, families with kids, right? So when he says mistakes or us, people know what he's talking about. You know what I'm talking about? Toys or us, right? You're, you know, I get that. If you've got kids, they want to go to Toys or us, and they, you try to chase them down the halls, and they're playing with the balls. No, I guess I'm playing with the balls, but anyway, my wife's yelling at me, put the balls back. But you know what I'm saying? You know, mistakes are us. That's a value we have at our church, he says, you know. He said, if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying. You're not trying to, 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 to you know, to expand your ministry and, and bring people to Christ. I think we're out of time. So uh, I think that was pretty much everything. We can always uh, discuss more about that next week. Uh, next, oh, I have these schedules. If, if people don't have them, let me know. Oh, I forgot the post-it notes. Okay. I will do those next week. So don't let me forget. I'll save them. So next, uh, we're, next week is the 7th. Is that right? So we're doing problem solving and attitude. So if you come with a grumpy attitude, no, I'm just kidding. You can come with a grumpy attitude if you want. So we're doing uh, chapter 5 and 6, uh, problem solving and attitude. We're going to cover that next time. And like always, if you have any questions about it, you can bring that up too. Let me pray quick and I'll let you go. Father, thanks for today, for the opportunity for us to gather together. Thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the wisdom that uh, is in this book and that has been proven, uh, not just in your church, but in other organizations, Lord, that have people in it. We thank you for this church and the great things you're doing here, Lord. We love you, and it's in your sons and we pray. Amen.